You are listening to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. Season ticket holders and lifelong fans with neighborhood ties discuss Cubs news and neighborhood happenings. Here's your hosts, Jeremy and Pat. Hello and welcome to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. This is episode 340 of the podcast. My name is Jeremy Deemer and I'll be your host. Joined as always by my co-host, he's my cousin, and he's high atop Wrigleyville tonight. How's it going, Pat? It's great, Jeremy. It's been a busy week for me of baseball game attendance. I look forward to hearing about all of the games, uh, and we will recap the entire week that was, and what a week it was for the Cubs. We have a lot to talk about, uh, a lot of positivity to start the season. I'm very excited, and so we're bringing on longtime friend of the podcast to help us break down all the news the performances, all the the happenings and the fun stuff going on with your Chicago Cubs right now. Please welcome back Matt Trueblood to the podcast. Matt, thanks for taking time out to talk Cubs with us tonight. Always, guys. I'm I'm very jealous, Pat, that you were at those games. Just lovely days for baseball, days and nights. I'll get to that in a few minutes, by the way. I got a story for you. Yeah, since last we podcasted, uh, the... Cubs completed the sweep of the Rockies, uh, albeit in terrifying fashion on the Wednesday game. Uh, And then they went ahead and won two of three, exceeding our expectations against the Dodgers. Uh, Pat, you mentioned you were in attendance. uh, You you were at the the Wednesday game. How cold was it? Well, let me say, start by saying I had wonderful seats for the game behind the dugout, and uh, I very much appreciated buying those for my dad and I uh, back when the forecast was 47 and dry. Uh, it turned out to be 25 degrees wind chill and it rained the entire time. And so uh, my dad wisely chose to stave off going to the game age 78. And I should have done the same, uh, but I brought a loyal friend, Jason with us, uh, with me, and we sat through the entire game. It started late because of the rain delay i guess and then they just decided you know what let's just play in the rain so that's what they did all game long and the good news was the cubs got up got off to a, a good start got a big lead and eight to two like we were this was a significant lead. In, you know a decent decent order uh it was eight to two and get the sweep of colorado i, I turned to my friend i said this is one of the worst teams in baseball we're playing famous last words in the bottom of the seventh because come the top of the eighth uh the cubs and we, as fans, suffered through a 46-minute eighth inning. Uh, the God. game ended up going three full hours, which doesn't happen in the pitch clock era, and especially when it's 25 degrees wind chill. At one point, I didn't know if it was raining or snowing because it was coming down in solid form, but it felt like rain. Uh, and uh, it was a, a rough day. I, I did say at several points that the Cubs must win this game more than almost any other game because I was not about to have sat through three hours of a game only to lose in that kind of fashion to this awful Rockies team. And the Cubs defense was terrible. Ian Happ, I don't know what he was doing. He started it off by by thinking, I think, a fly ball might be going off the wall at a high level or going into the stands, and it fell at the base of the wall, could have easily caught it. And then we had some some fun times on the infield with, with uh, Christopher Morrell and everybody else just kind of throwing the ball around. Not not a great uh, look for the Cubs, but I did have some hope because it reminded me of a game that I attended probably, I don't know, 16 years ago uh, when the Cubs had a huge lead against the Rockies and in the top of the ninth gave up eight runs, uh, thanks to Bobby Howery and company who gave up several, multiple three-run, two-run home runs. And then the Cubs won in the bottom of the ninth on a walk-off base hit by Alfonso Soriano. So I knew, I knew in my heart of hearts that this was a winnable game. And sure enough, the Cubs did pull it out, but not without some help. Um, nothing like the hero of the game being Miles Masturboni striking out, uh, mm-hmm. but thinking he hadn't struck out, standing at home plate, arguing. They, uh, the, the home umpire at first uh, says that he you know, made no call, and they, they um, appealed it, I think, to the uh, third, third base umpire. And, uh, and he said, nope, you're out. Luckily, the ball had, had somehow um, traveled back to the backstop. And Miles uh, put on the burners and the Rocky six-foot-five catcher, largest catcher I've ever seen in my life, uh, 
uh, couldn't get the ball and then throw it to first in time. So uh, we got a drop ball, third strike to lead off the inning, and the rest was history. The Cubs eked out a run, and it all was good at the world. And Alzali closed the door to yes. complete the sweep. And, uh, and got a win, by the way, because the relief pitchers the Cubs had used, I think it was Almonte and Naris, were so ineffective that they, that they you know, normally if a reliever comes in and, and does poorly but gets out of the inning, it'll be one of those funny ha-ha, he gets the win kind of things, right, instead of a hole. But they were so bad that the official score uh, made a, a kind of a rare call and said, you know what, no, no way. We're giving the win to um, Alzale. Of course, he probably preferred the save, but whatever. Uh, that's the way it goes. And uh, all's well that ends well. It was a it, it was quite a series, uh, Matt, for for the Cubs to get through. They had to win those. Uh, you know, thinking back to last September and losing two out of three against an equally bad Rockies team last year, and it, it really cost the Cubs down the stretch. So I was happy to see them actually be able to beat the bad Rockies team this year. Yeah. What you almost forgot, Pat, is one of the inexorable axioms of Cubs baseball, which is weird stuff happens when the Cubs play the Rockies. It (laughs) does. You will not ever get through a full series between these two teams where something wacky or wild or, you know, something has to happen. We could list the Howry game as a perfect example, not just the utter collapse and then the comeback win. But, like, halfway through that outing, a fan tried to, like, charge Bobby Howery on the oh, mound. That's right. On, yeah. <laughs> and sadly like, missed. There's always a a total mind bender somewhere in the whole sequence, too. Something that just seems completely improbable. I was um, in the upper deck of that game. Three fights broke out at the top of the ninth from very drunk fans who were just angry with what was going on on the field and started punching each other. It was It was, a, it was an odd day. The Mongo McMichael game was against the Rockies. Yep. <laughs> the craziest ending in possibly baseball history. I mean, I it's just something about these two teams. The universe has set them at very strange angles to each other. So, yeah, it was uh, all, up until that point, though, they had played really impressive baseball, the kind you should play against a miserable baseball team. And obviously, Shota Imanaga and the home opener showing out and exactly the way they would have dreamed uh just looks like they nailed that signing and the rockies will make you look like that but there's a lot of reason to believe that was legit so huge series huge huge week for him and then a series where we thought it'd be a success if the cubs just got one win against the dodgers but they were in fact able unable to, take, to do that were they? they they were unable to do that they failed at that mission because they took two out of three against the dodgers the Friday game, uh, Cubs fell behind two to nothing in the first inning. Uh, Kyle Hendricks threw 33 pitches. It was uh, off to a uh, a scary start. Uh, Bobby Miller was looking okay through one inning, <laughs> striking yeah, Matt, out the were side. You one of the Bobby Miller no hitter uh, tweeters that day. <laughs> yep, and I am not apologizing for it. That dude is a freak. I don't, when he got the first five outs, did you think, you know what, that's that's as far as he's going. He's gonna, he's just going to get shelled from here on out. <laughs> it's just I, baseball is is weird like that. But, yeah, he that first inning is, I think, something closer to what Bobby Miller really is. And the Cubs could not touch him. I mean, I, I think I saw in Seiya Suzuki's eyes a moment of maybe I just go back to Hiroshima. It, like four pitches into that at bat, it was just filthy, unbelievable. And then to come out the next inning and not have nothing quite. I mean, the Cubs put up really great at bats, but they just figured him out on the fly. It was incredible. Putting up five runs, chasing Bobby Miller from the game in just the next inning. Cubs go on to win nine seven, get the save from Alzale. This is uh this was a really fun game. Uh and then Saturday, the Cubs lose. Yamamoto, he pitched incredibly well, striking out eight, allowing just three hits, five scoreless innings. But the story of the game for the Cubs was the performance of Jordan Wicks. And I know, Matt, you wrote about this on your website, mm-hmm. uh, the success of Jordan Wicks, four and two-thirds innings, six hits, two earned runs, 
Only one walk, seven Ks. What a performance against this Dodgers lineup, which is absolutely nuts. Yeah. I mean, the tests he's faced in his first two starts of the year, the Rangers and Dodgers, I, he's not going to have a tougher two-start stretch unless and until the Cubs make the playoffs from here. Uh, and to come through it, you know, he could have gotten a little better defensive support. He probably also got a little lucky. There were some hard hit balls that went right at people. But the ability to miss bats and the way that I think he's he's figured out what each pitch does for him within his repertoire, when to throw it, how to sequence it, how to play it off of other stuff. Uh, there's been a fast maturation process and then just an improvement in the overall pitch quality. That fastball is livelier this year, the four seamer especially. So it was it was awesome to see. And and he didn't do it cheaply in that, you know, that Dodgers lineup is stacked. You get to the top of the lineup and it's just exhausting to read the names, let alone to face them. But but he uh he had several uh moments when he had a couple of men on base and one out and he struck out back to back hitters, all stars, all of it felt like. And uh, and and probably could have escaped without giving up any earned runs had he uh, you know we had that unfortunate situation where he's probably gassed I guess at that point but they took him out and uh, and the bullpen let him down a little I, I did I will say this the I don't know if you noticed this or thought this but I I felt like the umpire in that game was calling a lot of strikes for both teams uh, certainly uh, Yamamoto got strike calls on pitches that were like three I mean. First of all, he, the movement on his pitches is, is just phenomenal, right? It's amazing. But that doesn't mean they're strikes either. And I feel like this is – if ever there was a case for robot umpires, watch the tape of that game. And what it proves to me is that pitchers who throw fast with a lot of movement, it's hard for the human eye to, to be able to figure out where the balls are going. And, and I think the Cubs were uh, came up on the short end of that a couple times with pitches that were clearly not strikes. But – who knows, right? Because they're moving so fast and 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 so furiously, but yeah. uh, you know that'll happen too. You know he's a good pitcher. Yeah, I, I thought it actually was interesting. On those two days, it sort of played more in the Cubs' favor on Friday and then in the Dodgers on Saturday because uh, the Cubs clearly were not. They, they found something they could pick up on Bobby Miller. They never found anything like that on Yamamoto. So they were going to take a very patient approach and just hope to draw some walks. And they probably deserved a couple more than they got, but they were being very patient. So they were in a position to take a lot of called strikes. Uh, whereas on Friday, the Cubs were aggressive. They were driving the ball whenever Miller sort of came into or around the zone. The contrast between Miller's stuff and Kyle Hendricks's stuff, I thought Hendricks was getting a really wide plate. Uh, which I think just partly came from, oh, it is so much easier on the umpire's eyes to see. I mean, the, the movement is more predictable. The ball's just in the air longer in front of you. He was getting calls that Miller wasn't getting, and so that broke the Cubs' way. The next day, just because of the dynamic between the two lineups and the pitchers who are on the mound, it broke in the Dodgers' favor. But yeah, big zones, I think, I, I feel like sort of all season so far, the zone's been a little on the big side but especially in those two games. So on Saturday's game, when Wicks comes out, and, and I ask you this specifically because I know that you are the president and founding member of the Jose Quas fan club. <laughs> uh, and Quas came in and, and had another rough go of it. What's what's your take on, um, as president, what's your take on on, on Quas this year? What, what has not gone right? Yeah, he's just, it's a hit and miss thing. And it's so frustrating to have a guy. I don't think they miss though. They just hit. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes he misses the zone yes. by a lot. Yes. So that's the hit and the miss. Uh, it's frustrating to have a guy like that in the role of fireman, of come in and get out of a jam. I, I see why they sort of like him for that role. He induces a lot of pop-ups, like a crazy number of pop-ups, because he comes from that weird angle. The stuff has unique movement. Uh, it's a great way to sort of get yourself out of an inning. I I haven't looked up the numbers on this, but, you know, some relievers you can measure by how do they do against their first batter into the ballgame? Because they're often going to be called in with runners on base needing to keep preserve a tie or preserve a, a narrow lead. I don't think Quas does that well. He takes a minute to get 
to find the range, especially on that slider. And if he doesn't have the slider, then nothing else in his repertoire works. If people can sort of spit on the slider, everything else becomes a lot more hittable. So I'd rather have him be able to come in and clean innings. Uh, but the Cubs aren't in a position with the construction of their bullpen right now where they can do that. They needed Jose Quas to come in and be a fireman who could get the first guy he saw out in that situation. And in multiple situations going back to last year, I just don't think that's who he is at this point. So, so why not bring Luke Little in in that situation against Muncie, lefty? Uh, well, because he wasn't, I guess he could have stuck with uh, Wicks through – no, he, well, he could have gone and gotten little, right? But the first batter that he, any of them was going to have to face was Teoscar Hernandez. Yeah. Um, the way Craig Council thinks. And, you know, it's in line with Teoscar's career uh, splits. He, he hits lefties well. I don't think he wanted a lefty facing him in that situation. He definitely didn't want Wicks facing him a third time in that spot. And I think if he had a little more faith, if, if I had a little more faith, I could recommend this to say uh, – Luke Little is ready to get righties out consistently, then I think that would have been the play. But I think Council probably sees what I see when I look at Little at this point, which is impressive stuff. The sweeper is great. The fastball is explosive, especially from a guy of that size. I don't see what he does that's going to consistently get righties out at the level that you want to. If Again, you're, you're coming into, it's only the fifth inning, but that's a pretty high leverage situation. So I think he was thinking, I, I don't like the matchup with Wicks. I don't like the matchup with Little. I've got to hold back a couple of these guys. And we found out later why Julian Merriweather wasn't going to be one of the, the people marching out. Um, it, I just think he, he ended up saying, Quas is my best option because at least it's right on right. And maybe I'll get Teoscar to expand on the slider. Didn't work out. Nearly a three-hour rain delay on Sunday, but the Cubs are able to get a blowout win here. Uh, you mentioned at the top of the show, Matt, Shota Imanaga looking great again. Four scoreless innings here before the rain. Uh, so he struck out three, uh, only allowing two hits through his first two major league outings. He now has 12 strikeouts, no walks. And four hits scattered over 10 scoreless innings. Uh, you mentioned they nailed the signing. Uh, this is uh, this is pretty pretty impressive stuff here from from Imanaga. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I I was big on this signing. I really I wouldn't have minded if they spent even more than they actually spent on him. And I won't be surprised if they end up picking up that fifth year option and pushing the contract out to its maximum value. Uh, even even having said that, he's probably, you know, he's not going to have a zero ERA and strike out 10 batters per nine innings with yeah, no walks I all season. <laughs> I know. But it it's really watching him actually work in a competitive setting against big league hitters. It can start to come home to you. Oh, nobody sees anything like Shota Imanaga on this side of the Pacific Ocean. They just don't. It's a lowish release point but a lot of carry on the fastball and then the splitter. Well, we have guys like that in the States. They all throw right-handed. I mean, all of them. Last year in the major leagues, righties threw 15,000 splitters and change. Lefties threw 614. It's that huge wow. a disparity. Lefties come at you with straight changes and circle changes and sometimes a bit of a scroogey lefties don't throw splitters in MLB. And here comes Imanaga with great command of a fastball at the top of the zone that's going to get right over your bat and induce weak contact consistently. And then that splitter that nobody has practice hitting here. It's going to be and a while best, before they figure him out. The best part of that is that you couldn't pick a better era for him to come into because with the balanced schedule, he's going to play everybody like once or twice. So yep. it's not like the old days where you play your own division 18 games each or whatever it was, and, and then you play the other NL team six games, and that's it. I mean, we're really in an in a era where he may not face the same team twice for four months. Yep. Yeah. I, I It really – it all was coming up Shoda. I think especially given that they're down steel and the 
bullpen is thinning out more than you'd like by this point and at the beginning of April. Uh, he's shaping up to be the most important addition they made this winter and like a massively valuable one. I only wish that rain delay had come about 20 minutes later so he could have gotten the fifth inning and gotten the win. Just, you know, just for the fun of it. Can we? Can I ask you guys, though? I mean, you've been watching even longer than I have uh, Cubs games at Wrigley Field. Have you ever seen them try so hard to avoid a rain delay that they literally stopped play in the middle of an inning for like 10 minutes to work on the infield? But it wasn't a rain delay. Yeah, the, I, the ground I, crew is frantically scrambling around runners on first and second. I've never seen that before. And I've never seen it that early. If this, if it had been the fifth inning, right? The mm-hmm. top of the fifth. And they thought we're one batter away from an official game. Maybe I could see that. And maybe that's happened. But they were far from it. There was one out in the fourth with two men on. And then you had the fifth inning coming. And you knew the rain was coming. They had the forecast in front of them. Yep. It did seem odd that they put all that effort into because usually what they'll do is they'll throw the tarp on to preserve the field, uh, mm-hmm. which they clearly were not doing. I was appreciative of your reminding everyone that um, unlike in years past, when if a game did not go the full five innings, uh, people would lose, such as, I don't know, August 8th of 1988, uh, <laughs> when Ryan Sandberg lost a home run and, and many other things happened because the game didn't go five innings and they had to pick it up at the beginning on another day. Now, and I think this is a smart rule too, and it, it should avoid situations like you're just, you're, you're describing actually. Uh, the If a game doesn't go a full five innings, they can just pick up wherever they left off and they don't have to worry about starting the game over. Um, that makes suspend a lot of the sense. game now instead of yeah. starting over and saying it doesn't count. And that used to be a thing for the Cubs before they had lights where they would, depending on what was going on, they would want to say, well, it's a suspended game because of darkness, right? Mm-hmm. As opposed to because of rain. Because if it was rain, they'd have to start all over again. And if it was darkness, right. they could they could pick up where they left off the next day or whatever. And again, with these balanced schedules, it's that much harder to deal with rainouts than ever before. And we saw that in the Rocky series probably had a lot of in- influence over why they played an entire game in a rainstorm in 25 degree wind chilling. They would not have done that against the Pirates, probably, or against Milwaukee or any other NL Central foe, or even in past years when they would play a team more than once. But this was the only time they were going to face the Rockies. It's the only time they're going to face the Dodgers at home. And so there's a lot more pressure, I think, to, to get the games in. But but that rule change, I think, goes a long way towards at least not avoiding the sort of absurdity of – or being able to avoid the absurdity of, of having – all the all the good things that happen in a game like this not count and other shenanigans that occur when you think you might get a game scratched completely. Right. Yeah. Do you think the do you think the players association would rather play in these conditions and try to get the games in or would they rather have non-domed teams in bad weather start on the road for the first few weeks of the season? I think I think they'd still rather the former because while the players, you know, it's not the player's job to line the owner's pockets. Uh, players know their, how much they're going to end up getting paid correlates to revenue. And the reason that they don't do that, you know, the, the thing that everyone asks for every season, can we just have the Dodgers and the Padres and the Marlins and the Astros and the Brewers and the Mariners all start at home and, you know, play 60, 65% home games throughout April. Everyone pleads for it, and understandably so, except none of those teams want to have their their home schedule front-loaded into a segment of the, of the season when everyone's still in school and they can't charge as high of prices and fans are less likely to come out even though they're protected from the weather or even though there's no weather to be protected from. So the reason the league doesn't do it is that on balance it would cost them money. And I think the players don't love playing in bad weather, but they don't detest it so much that they'd rather fork over, you know, a few million dollars per team per year in order to to get out of that situation. 
I think the player association would just assume play all those games in Sacramento. What do you think? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> who, who wouldn't? Yeah. <laughs> or perhaps not. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Pat, you were in one of these weather protected stadiums uh this week you saw another game you not only uh, did you yeah, freeze on the wednesday it. game yeah. you froze on wednesday but you had a uh, more, much more pleasant weather experience for another game where'd you go i got wind chill on i got wi- I, like i, I frostbite, frostbite on wednesday <laughs> on my pinky finger by the way thank you very much uh so saturday i went on a secret mission with my wife's cousin's husband uh to uh what used to be known as Miller Park, which is now American Family Life or whatever they call it, uh, and uh, watch the Brewers game just to kind of do a little scouting uh, mission for the Cubs. And they're playing the the Mariners, who the Cubs are going to be facing soon. And uh, I got to see some interesting things. You know, the Cubs fans, such as myself, uh, have looked at the Brewers of the last couple of years as being this really strong pitching team. And the loss of Woodruff and Burns and Hayter and now Devin Williams, the the new closer who's been fantastic for half a year, uh, you know, leaving them with like Freddie Peralta and Colin Ray and uh, you know, and a handful of other folks, seems like uh, a very advantageous position for Cubs fans to be in after having to deal with like Cy Young quality pitchers all the time for seemingly ever. But I got to tell you, uh, as bullish as I am on the Cubs' chances against the Brewers' pitching, I got to tell you, the the last couple of years, one of the things that we've always had in our back pocket is we could look at the Brewers' lineup and say, you know what? Sorry, but you know, <laughs> especially when Yelich was was in his two year slump. But but even with Yelich last year doing better, I remember you know we sat in the bleachers. Remember last August thirtieth, and we're watching the game and we're looking at the lineups. And right, they got like two guys hit over 200 on this roster. What is going on? Well, that's not the case anymore. I think I'm I'm a little bit nervous. This uh, this Churio kid looks really good. Terang is a disruptor on the base paths. Um, you know, they still have Willie Damas. They still have Yelich, who hasn't fallen off yet. Um, our our old buddy uh, Willem Contreras, the uh, brother of Wilson, is hitting well, although maybe not pitch framing well, Matt. He's hitting well. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, they've got self real and you, you look around and I'm having these flashbacks of who the hell is Corey Hart and all, you know, like the old days of, <laughs> of, of like, uh, how they kept constantly bring up JJ Hardy and, and who are all these guys that keep showing up and, and getting clutch hits against us. And, and I do think that the Brewers offense, uh, although it's early still, it's hard to say, but it, it has the potential to be, I think, far more potent and more scary than offenses of the past couple of years. I don't know, Matt, I know you uh, moonlight with that organization. I don't know what your thoughts are, but that, that's sort of my initial impression. No, I'm right there with you. I think they're, I don't think they're a better team than they were last year, but they're a far more balanced team. Um, they've, you know, they have lost a lot of pitching value. And I think that's going to be where the challenge lies for them. The Cubs and Brewers have had some, interesting similarities over the last couple of years, especially last year, like uh, very good in terms of walk and strikeout rates. Most of the time uh, offensively I'm talking about, but didn't necessarily produce power at the key moments, sort of a very opposite field or, or center to opposite field approach uh, with the drawbacks that comes with that. And also the upside. Uh, well, I think that's continued to be true. But now the teams are also more similar on the pitching side where there's a lot of upside to some aspects of the pitching staff, but you're worried about, will they have the depth to hold up over a long season, especially with injuries tugging at at both of them. So very similar teams at this point. And yeah, that includes just the way I think we feel pretty good about the Cubs lineup depth and not only one through nine, there's contributors. There's also a couple of guys on the bench that you trust in certain situations, depending on what you need. Well, the Brewers have reached that point, too, really fast. Uh, Churio is crazy. I mean, I don't... don't 20 years old, I think, right? Not only 20, but, like, turn 20 in mid-March. It's not like... Is he he the fifth youngest player in history or something ridiculous to start a game? He's He led off for them on opening day, which set some kind of record. I'm not sure, but it's... He is a freak athlete and just... The feel for for the barrel, for finding 
both gaps. I mean, he can, his first big league homer was driven to the right of dead center. It's stuff you don't see out of 20 year olds. And it comes with a whole lot of speed. He's a little rough edged in places. And I, I think the plate approach, the routes he takes in the outfield, those things will take the entire year and maybe more to clean up. But he's the type of guy who can produce four wins of value even while he's doing that. So, and yeah. This is one of the things I've been cautioning our Cubs fan followers and, and listeners about, which is that we talk about the Cubs farm system, but you can't do it in a vacuum because while the Cubs do have some exciting players in their system, the rest of the NL Central just happens to be chalk filled of other teams with exciting players in their system too. And in many cases, players who, who at least on the offensive side, are probably more dynamic and better than what the Cubs have. The Cubs have a lot of like left field or DHs in their system. It's it's looking more and more likely, uh, with the exception of PCA. But but you know, and I'm looking at the Reds and I'm looking at the Pirates and I'm looking at the Brewers and even the Cardinals. God help us. I see some players who who could be some really you know solid like solid to all star level. Um, position players very shortly. Yeah. The the Pirates, I mean, one guy First obviously... Pirates. We're a game and a half behind the Pirates and we're 6-2. <laughs> and two. How did that happen? <laughs> but it's been... There have been some chaotic wins in there. Like, it's not not as though they're out here steamrolling teams. And no. some of their wins came against the Marlins, so discount <laughs> that a bit. But we haven't even seen Paul Skeens yet. That's probably a month or two yeah. away. Who's going to be a great starting pitcher? He's, he, he has that kind of Strasburg vibe to him all of a sudden, right? Like he's going to be – like it, it seems like he's definitely going to be the next real deal the minute he steps foot on a major league mound. Yeah. I mean, he's that caliber of prospect for the first time since – maybe since Strasburg or since Matt Harvey or Jose Fernandez, something like that. And since Strasburg retired today, it would be a perfect like bookend. It would be. Now, if they call him up to make his debut against the Nationals, just like Strasburg made his against the Pirates, it gets spooky. But even while they wait for Skeens, they've got, they just installed Jared Jones. He won their fifth starter spot, effectively, fourth or fifth or whatever you want to say. Well, Jared Jones is like 98 with a couple of pretty strong secondaries. He's, he's better. He's probably like right on par with maybe a half step behind in terms of long term projection, Kate Horton. And that's the guy the Pirates called up as an afterthought, like the consolation prize to the fans because they didn't get Paul Skeens. I mean, I I don't think the Pirates are going to turn out to be good by the time this full season plays out, but they're dangerous in a way that they weren't last year and haven't been since 2016 or so. And that's supposed to be the weak link in the division. I think the real weak link in the division is the Cardinals. But, yeah, these this is not going to be an easy division to win. Although if the Cubs had invested more and, you know, shored up more things this winter, maybe it still could have been. At this point, it's definitely not going to be. It is yeah, strange. The Cardinals have that huge advantage with the uh, discount all their pitchers get with AARP. You know, they are at 20% <laughs> off at Denny's and whatnot. Yeah. It is, it is strange to look at the schedule and see no division games in the month of April at all. Uh, the first time the Cubs will see the Brewers and the Pirates, they play both of those teams seven times in the month of May. So you will, uh, you'll have to wait till May to see any division rival here as we look ahead to the week that will be. The Cubs continue to play the West, and they will go on a West Coast road trip Three games in San Diego, followed by three against the Mariners, who you just saw in action, Pat. Uh, and then they get three more against the World Series representatives from just a year ago, the Arizona Diamondbacks, before they can come back home to play the Marlins and the Astros. Looking ahead to this series on the West Coast, this is uh, this is where we f- we see if this team can do what they did at home out on the road because uh, that was a real struggle last year for this team um, to, to be able to do it on the road. They always seem to have a, a weird West Coast trips. Um, and so here against San Diego, uh, the pitching matchups are, are tough for the Cubs here. Monday, Assad against Darvish. Tuesday, TBD against Musgrove. And Wednesday, Hendricks against Dylan Cease. So you're going to face... Uh, 
tough, tough series here in uh, San Diego, Matt. The Justin Steele effect is starting to take hold, right? Like they were able to get away from not using him against the Rockies, but um, they're going to need him back or someone to fill that role. And just looking at the pitching matchups you described, Jeremy, of those six games, I think the Cubs will probably be favored in one of them based on the starting pitcher, probably the Imanaga Hancock game. Other than that, I don't see the Cubs being favored in any of those games uh, because the the Cubs pitching, starting pitching has been, we've kind of papered over it with really good offense so far and with some, especially when play the Rockies, some, some poor hitting, but uh, Cubs have a lot, I mean, (laughs) there just isn't, there isn't a lot that you can necessarily count on. I mean, Assad had a good game. It'd be nice if he could keep doing that, but you keep waiting for the other shoe to drop on that one. He outperforms his peripherals. That's great. But sometimes people don't always do that. Sometimes they do. Look at Kyle Hendricks. He did it for like seven years. Speaking of which, Kyle Hendricks is not a guy who seems like he's going to get a lot of pitches back a Fernando, past a Fernando Tatis type uh, hitter these days. Um, you know, Wicks has been, has, has been serviceable to good, but isn't going deep into games. The bullpen, as Matt pointed out, is injured and in shambles, tired already. Uh, because they've had to pitch a lot of extra innings due to unforeseen circumstances. And, uh, and you, yeah, you look at the rotation and it's like, ugh. Um, they need, I hate to, I, I never thought of what it says, but they desperately need like Teon to come back or something. Not come back and pitch like he did today, but come back, you know, in some capacity where he's actually decent. I don't know. Uh, am I wrong in being too pessimistic about the next week and a half or so or two weeks? Well, I would say, but we already talked about how Wicks has shown us some impressive stuff and we might see, you know, it was shorter starts partially because defense let him down and forced some extended innings, partially because those lineups are buzz saws. The Padres lineup, the Mariners lineup, the Diamondbacks lineup, they're not nothing. It's not like getting the White Sox and the A's, but they're not buzz saws. There, you can find your outs in those lineups. You, you know where to go to get them. Uh, so I'd look forward to seeing Wicks. I think he, uh, Council really has to be hoping he can stretch him out and get some more length from him. Like six uh, innings at least, right? Right. That's that's the goal anyway. And Assad, he made some material changes from the way he was attacking hitters last year in terms of pitch mix and his start too. Now, again, it's the Rockies. We can't guarantee that it's going to work just because it's different. Um, But if you wanted to say this guy who has had a bunch of success up to this point in his career, but we feel feel like or we fear that it's been smoke, smoke and mirrors. Well, the most comforting thing you could see is him making changes that the league hasn't forced on him is him saying, I know that it's a little bit smoke and mirrors, too. But what if I throw different smoke and turn the mirrors a bit maybe they still won't find their way out of the mains um so you i think it's fair to hold out some hope on those guys i also think they really have to they have to get more length out of hendrix he might have to wear one in here somewhere where you know he he does get five or six runs pushed across against him but he still gets you through six just to spare the bullpen a bit uh and you have to keep getting good stuff from imanaga and i think that cbd based on how he pitched against the Rockies the other night is most likely to be Ben Brown. So at this point we might get to see whether he can just settle into the rotation in the short term, Um, especially with the travel and the schedule starting to fill up with games and not have as many off days. I think they'd like to lengthen it out to six for a short time. So even when Tyone comes back, doesn't necessarily mean Brown's going out right away. Much like Imanaga, he really got rooked out of a win uh, against, yeah. against the, I mean, he pitched really well yeah. against the Rockies, only to have the team give up a six-run lead in the eighth. Who would have thought? Um, that was, but it was nice to see him, and he was very pumped when he came back into the dugout after that that uh, seventh inning. I mean, he deserved it. He pitched fantastic. It's great to see that after his spring, you see him come up and actually just have a great outing like that. It was uh, really exciting to see, and hopefully, yeah, if he is the TBD against Musgrove, he can have uh, uh, another. Another good performance from from Brown. I think everyone's rooting for that guy. When you say that Hendricks might have to wear one here and and give up a lot of runs, 
you do realize the ZRA is over 11 right now. So, <laughs> I, I mean, I, not much more you can wear. You better wear a bulletproof vest if you're going to do that. Again, I think the uh, Kyle Hendricks, I think he's still got something in the tank, but the defense can't let him down. When the defense lets him down, it's going to get ugly in a hurry. And it did in both of his first two starts. Plus, facing the Rangers and the Dodgers is not a recipe for Kyle Hendricks to have success. It's like uh, three years ago when he had that start that made us all go, oh, is this the end against Atlanta? Uh, yeah. Where they just they were That's teeing Sunday off. Sunday night game where you give up six home runs, that one? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they just, if you've got a lineup that good with that much power in it, they're going to they're going to square him up at some point. They're going to get him in the crosshairs. It's he's still good enough to find his way, pick his way, eke it out and be really good against lesser lineups against the tougher ones. You got to have a quick hook and the defense has to do its job behind you. And if it doesn't, then it looks like what it's looked like over the first two starts. He will face the Padres for what it's worth. Which again is uh, a year ago. That was really scary. Now it's, you know, it's still Xander Bogarts and Manny Machado and Fernando Tatis, but it's not Juan Soto. And right. it's, you know, it's a little. There go three walks right there. <laughs> and uh, Trent Grisham's out of there, too. Like the bottom of their lineup gets really sort of hilarious. I don't mean to be mean, but it's it's as top heavy as a lineup gets. So, again, Kyle Hendricks savvy. Does he really work the edges against those? guys at the top and say like Greg Maddox near the end used to know I'm going to get most of my outs today from five through nine in the lineup. I, I'm going to walk some people and that's okay. It doesn't mean I have bad control. It means I know better than to put one in the middle of the plate against that guy. A guy who hopefully can continue his offensive production. Uh, I wanted to ask you about Seiya Suzuki. We are really high on Seiya Suzuki this season here on a po- on the podcast. Really and, since August of last year, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, Matt, I wanted to get your thoughts on what we've seen so far from Seiya Suzuki. Uh, it, he's hitting the ball so hard. That's been the story everyone's uh, talking about. And the success he's, he's finding, the confidence he's playing with right now uh, is something we... Uh, you know, when he hit some of his slumps last year, uh, it it looked it looked real bad. But uh, here, you mentioned since August, this is uh, uh, he's righted the ship, and this has been just an exceeding <laughs> exceedingly high performance for him to start the season. And uh, hoping we can see this on the road trip uh, continue as well. Yeah, I, he's really he's at one of the very best hitters in baseball levels right now. That's a lot to ask of him and i think it's still possible because <laughs> i i've been i've been this high on Seiya since he came over and there have been you were high on the week before he came over so there <laughs> <laughs> i i have been a big old whiner about him in the outfield and i still think it's he has a he has a plus 0.1 war in the outfield this year i looked it up yeah so well, he's turned a corner on cloudy days against dark backgrounds, I, he is a stud. Uh, but anyway, that's that's a separate issue. At the plate, I have been wild about Seiya through a lot of ups and downs ever since he joined the Cubs. And what what was so frustrating was to see a guy who, even when he was in those ugly slumps, could still put a hurt on the ball, but it would go down and basically right at the shortstop. And that was a timing issue. It was born of a lot of it, honestly, was born of a passivity in his approach. He had always had a certain approach of very, I don't expand the zone. I swing not only just at strikes, but at my strikes. This part, it's a hitting zone, not a strike zone for him. And I think when he realized, it sort of clicked eventually that You can't. In this league, there are too many guys who can spot multiple pitches within the zone. They can land their slider consistently enough, and it might be a fraction out of the zone, and you might see it, say it, but umps are going to call that too often. you got to get the bat moving. you got to get the bat head out because you're also not going to punish anything if you let it travel on you so much that you're often rolling over or uh, getting jammed. And when he 
figured that out and got this much more aggressive. Still, he hardly ever swings at the first pitch. He wants to see the ball, and he wants to wait pitchers out. But when he realized that he just has to get a little more proactive about either, I'm cutting the plate in half here. I know it's coming in away, so I'm going to drive it to right center. Or I'm going to get the bat head out, turn on it, and it's going up and left instead of down and left. Uh, It just brought all the talent that was there all along incredible hand eye a bunch of strength great natural bat speed uh and a really intelligent approach that just didn't port perfectly from japan to the u.s he's finally made that that translation and i don't think he's going to suddenly sag backward that doesn't mean you know the league will counter adjust to him i don't think he's going to have a 1000 ops all season or whatever it is but i'm not ruling out 900 i'm Sky high on Seiya. It's time for predictions. We have to talk about the week that will be here. Uh, We're going to just look at the three against San Diego, the three at Seattle. Uh, So of those six games, Pat, we'll start with you. Um, How are the Cubs looking? I mean, I, I know I said that they'll only be favored in one of the six, but I'm optimistic, and I think they'll win two of them. Two and four. Two and four? Yeah. Matt, do you think uh, the Cubs are going to be uh, better than two and four, or you uh, agree with Pat that that's a uh, – it could be worse I, than two and four? I'm going to fall into a fallacy that I should know better than by now, but I've watched a good amount of the Padres and Mariners so far, and – they're looking warty, not like th- there's still a lot of talent, but the Mariners rotation is still ironing a lot of things out. The Padres are losing close games, just like they lost them last year. I think the Cubs go four and two this week. I hope uh, so. I, I will. Uh, I'll split the difference and say three and three. So. Well, well, we got an easy one. somewhere on, in man. here. We have this covered for sure. <laughs> yeah. So we again. The uh, the best pre pregame show in the business right here. Uh, come, you, this is where you get the hard hitting predictions. Uh, so we'll we'll have that covered, and then next week's podcast we will look at the end of the road trip as well as preview the upcoming series against the Marlins and Astros. And last question from me, and then I'll uh, throw it to you, Pat, before we start to wrap it up. Um, as someone who's seen a lot of. Craig Council over the years in Milwaukee. Uh, Matt, I wanted to get your feelings about his performance so far in Chicago. I think he's done just about everything the way I would have done it, with the exception of believing so much in in the Morrell experiment at third base. Uh, I'm the low man on that, which is hard to be, I think, but I just don't, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, that said... I love the daring and the creativity of saying, yeah, I know this guy sucks at defense and I'm going to have to take him out in the sixth inning on a semi-regular basis. And he still bats him clean up. And he goes, I can still find paths to winning this game, even though my cleanup hitter from the seventh inning on is going to be five foot five with a career slugging average in the, you know, low three hundreds. I, I love the creativeness of that, and I think it it shines through broadly in the way that he's attacked this season. He's obviously met some adversity already, and we're going to see just how nimble he can be with a bullpen now that Julia Merriweather's on the shelf for a while, and I'm guessing it's not going to be too short a while. Shoulders are bad, uh, and he's dealing with no steel right away. Uh, the challenges are there, but he has always impressed me. And I think the stuff that he's done so far indicates that he's gotten his arms around what this roster is and what it needs pretty quickly. So let me ask you then, Matt, my uh, final question for you today, who in the Cubs organization do you think will have the biggest, largest impact? Who's not currently on the major league roster this season on 2024. Yeah. I'm going to say Cade Horton. I think. I was hoping you'd say Bryce Harper because that would have been great. uh... (laughs) 
I, it could still be Luis Arise. I don't know how they'd fit him into the lineup, but I am a Luis Arise guy, and he's going to get traded now. So uh, that's my, my one to watch. But no, I, I think just there's going to be opportunity in the rotation. We know there is. There already is. Uh, and I think Horton is the one I trust most to sort of step forward and seize an opportunity. I, I'm not out on PCA by any means. But I also, I've, I've, I was always a little lower on the hype scale than most when it came to him, just because there are some big offensive questions there. He's answering some of them, maybe right now with a longer run at AAA, which I think was a good thing for him. But I just don't know that he or Owen Casey uh, or Matt Shaw are going to come up and do a lot this year. They might, they might plug a gap, sort of the way. Nico Horner did in 2019, maybe a little bit bigger than that, but I don't think they're going to make a huge difference. I think Horton's the guy who might get 12 starts down the stretch for any of a number of reasons, probably none of them good. Uh, At the moment, it won't feel good that they have to turn to him and really have no other choice, but I think he'll really impress us pretty much right away when he gets that shot. Well, before we close out it is the 40th anniversary of the 1984 chicago cubs team and so every week we have a feature where we uh, learn a little bit about the history of that very important chicago cubs 1984 team pat take us to uh, this day in 1984 all right this day in 1984 the cubs are completing their first week of the season with a three and three west coast road trip they, they beat the uh, giants two out of three Huey Lewis in the news played the national anthem on the first day. Uh, and then they lost two out of three uh, in, a, in an act of foreshadowing to the San Diego Padres. Uh, Ryan Sandberg hit two home runs. The the newly converted second baseman from third baseman in his second year was driving the ball. He got quite a few RBIs that week. It was a good first week for him. The Cubs were settling in a lot of positions uh, with new players, like we've talked about before. Gary Matthews and Bobby Dernier had just joined the team literally the week before. Friend Ron of the show. Say was now at third base. They had a lot of players. Leon Durham was playing more first base. There was just a lot going on in that in that regard. Uh, what I wanted to focus on today was just uh, just a quick recap of the Cubs' starting rotation to start the 1984 season because I think it's kind of a fun exercise as we look at the starting rotation of the Cubs today, uh, and many of us, myself included, don't see it as a playoff caliber starting rotation at this moment in time. Well, let me tell you about the 84 starting rotation. First off, it was a four-man rotation. Not a five-man, not a six-man, but a four-man rotation. That rotation consisted of Dick Ruthven, Chuck Rainey, Scott Sanderson, and Mike Trout, Steve Trout, sorry, Steve Trout. Mike Trout was not born yet. Steve Trout. Uh, and the four guys kind of came to the Cubs in interesting fashion. Sanderson had been acquired that off season and the other three pitchers had been acquired the year before. So they had all, they're all either the first or just starting their second year with the Cubs. Dick Ruthven was the ace of that team. He was the opening day starting pitcher. He had uh, pitched for quite a few years with the Philadelphia Phillies. He was a veteran he pitched on the World Series team where they won the World Series in 1980. So he was kind of brought the, the gravitas. However, his performance uh, over the last several years had not been necessarily meeting those expectations. He was no John Lester, let's put it that way. He was a barely average starting pitcher at that point in time. And the Cubs had traded for him in May of the previous season uh, to the Phillies and, and had given up. You remember Dallas Green was, was calling the shots for the Cubs and he had come from the Phillies organization. So there was a lot of a lot of trading back and forth. The Cubs had had flipped uh, a relief pitcher, a, a very mediocre middling relief pitcher named Willie Hernandez to the Phillies here in 1983 in May to acquire Ruth and who would then be the ace starter to start the 84 season. Uh, the Phillies then flipped Hernandez to uh, the Detroit Tigers, where in that very same 1984 season, Willie Hernandez became the first player, I think, ever to win the Cy Young and MVP as a closer uh in the same season so would have been good to have him on the cubs probably that year with his 192 era his 80 relief appearances and 140 innings pitched or i mean back then you know relief pitchers really put in the work uh but the cubs did not they had a starter dick ruthman 
the number two starting pitcher in that rotation, Chuck Rainey, who they had acquired a year before in exchange for Doug Bird. Doug Bird, you might remember, was who they had obtained when they traded Rick Russell and broke the hearts of many young child in Chicago a couple years before then. But uh, Chuck Rainey was most famous uh, on this podcast, as you know, for having thrown a, a near no hitter broken up by stupid Eddie Milner with that base hit with two outs in the ninth inning uh, when the Cubs were playing the Reds. Uh, ruining a perfect father-son moment with my dad and I watching it on WGN television after school one day, but that's a whole other story. One of our fans was so kind as to send me a ball, an autograph ball with Eddie Milner's <laughs> autograph on it, which I still have on the wall here, just to look at whenever I really want to get fired up about something. But <laughs> Chuck, that was Chuck Rainey's high point. He was not a very good pitcher. Um, had never been a very good pitcher, but he was the Cubs' number two starter that season. Uh, I would liken him to someone worse than anyone in the rotation today. <laughs> so... Yeah. If you want to, I, I'm trying to think of what the parallel would be with him, but I can't come up with one. Sorry. Uh, not as good as a uh, Jamison Tayon. How about that? Not even at that level. Not even close. He, uh, he was his generation's Chris Volstead. Yes. Yes. Chris Volstead. <laughs> nice. Perfect. Perfect, uh, perfect comparison. Um, the number three starter who they had acquired, who the Cubs had acquired that offseason was Scott Sanderson. Now, Scott Sanderson had had some good seasons with the Expos. In fact, I knew of Scott Sanderson. He had been an all-star one year. He was definitely considered a pretty good pitcher. Um, he had a, he had a kind of an off year the year before, which is probably how the Cubs got him. But they acquired him in a three-way deal with San Diego, where the Cubs gave up uh, promising young outfielder Carmelo Martinez, along with Craig Lefferts, who was a relief pitcher, somewhat sometimes start swing starter, but had had a couple good years, was young, too, himself. But the Cubs were... Uh, you know, definitely wanted, I can imagine Dallas Green looked at their rotation, thought, oh my God, I got to get something here. Uh, looked at it and thought, you know, Scott Sanderson as a number three uh, would be pretty good. And and that was at the time, I think, you know, what you would consider to be a good number three starter if you had a one and a two, which they did not. Uh, and then rounding out the four-man rotation was none other than Steve Trout, friend of the show. Friend we the may show, have yeah. on, I think, at some point this season, we'll see. Uh, he had been acquired uh, from the... Uh, Chicago White Sox in a blockbuster trade along with Warren Brewstar, a uh, Cub bullpen man, in exchange for a host of uh, of Cub players, uh, the most famous of which was was Dick Tidrow. They called him Dirt, Dick Dirt Tidrow, who was the setup man for Bruce Suter before the Cubs gave Bruce Suter to the Cardinals for nothing a couple years before. But he had been a setup man for the Cubs for several years. Good pitcher, tough guy, mustache, the whole thing, whole works, the whole like early 80s, you know, Sparky Lyle type of feel to him. So that was a loss, losing your setup man like that, especially when you gave up Lefferts as well. Um, but the Cubs also gave up a host of what I would call, if you look at a top baseball card from that era, it'd be like top prospects. And it's Randy Martz and Pat Tabler and Scott Fletcher and a bunch of names that no one today remembers. But if you were a child at that time and you got that baseball card, you were waiting for those names to, they have no internet, you're waiting for the names on that baseball card to appear at a major league game. And when they did, sadly, they did not live up to the hype of future star or whatever it said on the card. Uh, so the Cubs gave up a, a bunch of spare parts. It was obvious that that uh, Dallas Green was trying to clean house a little bit and get rid of some some uh, from what had been a notoriously poor farm system. Uh, the people who did matriculate to the majors and, and played fairly mediocre baseball. Uh, so they got rid of those three guys. And so that's what we had. That was the four man rotation heading into the season. Um, and so when you look at today's starting rotation, it feels like it's a little bit in tatters, or, you know, it's not, it's not really clear yet. Just know that it was much worse, uh, to start 84. It didn't, that was not a 96 win team starting rotation. Let's put it that way. But no, yeah, as spoiler alert, it doesn't end future episodes. Way. Yeah. Things change, things develop <laughs> and, uh, and, and we'll get to that in, in due course. That's right. You can follow along all throughout the season. Every single week as you subscribe to this podcast, we will be taking you through not just the 2024 Cubs season, but also that 1984 Cubs team as well. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. I can't believe time always flies so fast when we're talking to Matt Trueblood. Always a great time, Matt. Thanks for coming on. Please remind our listeners where they can find your work on the internet. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I had to stop and think a second i got distracted thinking about everything i know about scott fletcher uh <laughs> northsidebaseball.com uh is where you can find most of my cubs stuff i'm also writing throughout the year a series at baseball prospectus 
that's called Flyover Country that focuses on both the central divisions. And I've got work on the Twins and Brewers at sites that I run for them too. You can find everything I do on Twitter at M.A. Trueblood. And Matt will be back throughout the season as a uh, recurring guest on this podcast. We love to have him back uh, uh, all throughout the season. He's always always one of our favorites. And uh, you can follow us on all of our social media platforms as well, at Wrigleyville Nat. That's X, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Threads, Blue Sky. We're on all those places, at Wrigleyville Nat. Facebook.com slash Wrigleyville Nation as well. And, of course... We couldn't do this ad-free for another season without our our patrons over uh, our, our biggest fans and our biggest supporters over at patreon.com slash Wrigleyville Nation there. They help us keep the lights on. We pay our hosting fees. We pay for when a mic cable needs to be replaced. We pay for uh, lighting, uh, all this stuff, because now we're on a, we have the video version of the podcast over on our YouTube channel. Uh, so make sure you're subscribing over there as well. YouTube, uh, go there, search for Wrigleyville Nation Podcast. Even if you don't consume your podcast through video, just throw us a subscribe, a like. It helps us work the algorithm so other Cub fans can find the show. And uh, yeah, supporting us through the Patreon is is the best way to help keep this show ad-free. But if you can't support us uh, financially in these times, we understand you can support us free of charge just by telling your Cub fan friends about the show. Show them how to subscribe to a podcast. We're on every single podcast platform you can imagine. Uh, So please continue to spread the word. We rely on every single one of you to continue to uh, grow our audience and continue to come back for uh, another season. So we're... uh, we're, we're going to wrap it up this week. So, again, uh, thanks to Matt for joining us. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Jeremy. And just for all the fans out there, just remember, Randy Martz threw a palm ball. So as bad as Jose Quas might see him on a given day, at least he's not throwing a palm ball. Yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thanks again, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk to you again next time.